So we've alluded to this potential spin difference between excited states, specifically singlet and triplet excited states. And in this video, we're going to deepen our understanding of electron spin. And our major motivation for doing that is to understand a very important photophysical process in molecular photochemistry, the conversion of a singlet state to a triplet state. This is called intersystem crossing or ISC. And understanding ISC, the mechanism of it, really depends on a deep model of electron spins, one that goes beyond just the simple upspin and downspin model that you're used to from earlier chemistry courses. While this model has its uses, we actually have to take spin into three dimensions to appreciate the uh, intimate nature of intersystem crossing, for example. All right, so we have previously defined singlet and triplet states. Let's just remind ourselves of those definitions now again. Singlet states have net zero total spin. We're gonna represent that with the capital letter S. And so for singlet state, S is equal to zero. And unpaired electrons with opposing or anti-parallel spins. Triplet states have unpaired electrons with parallel spins and a total spin of one. S is one for a triplet state and the spins are parallel. They also have three magnetic substates, and we'll see what that means here in a second. So for each of the electronic configurations that we previously defined, we can identify singlet and triplet electron configurations, and they're different in fundamental ways. We depict them differently by showing the spins in each of the relevant occupied orbitals. So for example, in the n pi star state, we're talking about the singlet, which by the way, this Superscript 1 to the left of the electron configuration indicates the spin multiplicity, and if you see a 1 there, this refers to the singlet state. Anti-parallel spins means we can either write this like this, with the n orbital lower in energy and the pi star orbital higher in energy. This is one way to, pick, to depict this on an orbital energy diagram, or with both spins flipped, with a down spin in the n orbital and an up spin in the pi star orbital. Those are equivalently the singlet state. And there really is only one singlet state, and thinking about spin in three dimensions will help us uh, see that in a little bit here. The triplet in pi star state is represented like this with the electron configuration preceded by a superscript three. This indicates that the state is a triplet, its spin multiplicity is three. And here we represent it using the same orbitals, right? It's still the electron configuration is the same in terms of which orbitals are occupied, but now the spins are parallel rather than anti-parallel or opposed. And up, up, or down, down are our options here, for example. We can do the same for the pi pi star states. So let's do that really quick. So just as for the n pi star states, the singlet pi pi star state has anti-parallel spins in the SOMOs and the triplet state has parallel spins in the SOMOs, and the n orbital is unaffected, actually. There are still uh, a pair of electrons with opposing spins in the n orbital, but I draw it in because it shows up between the pi and pi star states in energy. When we talk about upspins and downspins, we're really only referring to the z component of a three-dimensional electronic spin vector. And here we're going to develop the electron spin vector model, thinking about spin as a vector in three dimensions, in all three directions, in other words. And electron spin is really profoundly governed and, and affected by the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And so that's, that's worth noting, actually, at the top of this slide, that we're going to be using the Heisenberg uncertainty principle to draw some conclusions about the three-dimensional nature of spin. One thing we'll say right off the bat is that typically we have complete certainty, complete awareness of the component of spin in a particular direction, say the Z component. Here that's labeled M. I'm also gonna to refer to this as lowercase SZ. It's the component of electron spin in the Z direction. When we know that, and we also know the length of the vector in total, capital S, which we do for the singlet and triplet states, remember that's either zero or one respectively, the x and y components of spin are completely uncertain. If you think about the geometric implications of this, this means that in the x-y plane, the components of spin could point in any direction. And so they sweep out a circle in the x-y plane. And when we take account of this known value of SZ, the z component, 
this means that the vector itself sweeps out a cone. So this is why you see a cone here. The electronic spin vector could be located at any point along this cone since Sx and Sy, the x and y components of the spin vector, are completely uncertain. And this is a consequence of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Essentially what we've done here is we've taken this basic model of an upspin electron where all we're really paying attention to is, is Sz and we've transformed it into three dimensions and, and deepened the model by appreciating that the x and y components of spin are completely unknown when we have awareness of the length of the vector, the total spin. And when we talk about upspins and downspins, those cones point in opposite directions since up and down refer to different directions along the z-axis, right? The upspin has a z component that is plus one half times Planck's constant over two pi or h bar. And the downspin has a z component that is negative one half times h bar. Each of those still sweeps out a cone. It's just the direction that the cone points in space differs, either along the z-axis or along the negative z-axis. And you'll see the symbols alpha and beta used to represent up and down spin vectors, the, the spin wave functions, the actual wave functions associated with these uh, vectorial situations. Now, one thing that's worth noting at this point about this cone, uh, for the moment, we're assuming that we have absolutely no knowledge of the x and y components because we have complete knowledge of the z component and the total length of the vector, capital S. There is one situation in which we know something about the x and y components, and that is the situation when a magnetic field is applied either parallel to or anti-parallel to the spin. So say we applied a magnetic field B in the direction of the spin in both cases. This causes the electron spin vector to process or rotate around the direction of that magnetic field. And in fact, both spins can do this. So if we apply a magnetic field in the opposite direction to the downspin, it will process or rotate around the direction of that magnetic field like so. And this procession has the capability to change a triplet state into a singlet state or vice versa, as we'll see. And these magnetic fields may come from internal magnetic moments associated with other electrons or nuclei as well. All right, so now we're in a position to see what the singlet and triplet states look like. What happens when we start combining multiple unpaired spins within a single molecule? Well, now what we're going to do is essentially look at the two vectors for the SOMO electrons. That's worth noting here that we're interested in the SOMO electrons and, and their spins since all of the other electrons in the excited state are paired. And in the singlet state, the total spin, the total length of the spin vector is zero. This means that when we add the individual spin vectors together, we must arrive at a resultant that is zero. And there's only one way to, ch to achieve this with the spin vectors exactly anti-parallel. So, a few things to point out about this situation. We've got two electrons, one and two. They have total spins S1 and S2, total spin vectors, capital S1, capital S2. And these vectors are pointing in opposite directions. And to, to emphasize that, um, let's do a little bit of highlighting. So this vector actually points back into the plane of the screen. This vector is pointed out towards you in front of that dotted line that you see in the back half of the cone. So these point in opposite directions exactly in three dimensions such that when we add them together in a vector sense, they add to zero. This shows you a planar view of the situation where we again see that the alpha spin associated with electron one and the beta spin associated with electron two are pointing in opposite directions. And the overall wave function for the singlet state is a superposition of, of the situation where electron one has alpha spin and electron two has beta spin and the situation where electron one has beta spin and electron two has alpha spin. And for quantum mechanical reasons that we don't get, need to get into, there's a minus sign here. Really, the most important thing is that the spins are exactly anti-parallel. This is the geometric intuition associated with the singlet state. In the triplet state, the total electron spin is equal to one. And there are actually three different ways that this can be achieved. And they differ in the z component of the resultant 
vector. Sz for the vector we get when we add the unpaired electron spins together. So let's see how that works. One way we can achieve a total spin vector of one is two alpha spin electrons pointing exactly in the same direction, exactly parallel to one another. In other words, we can overlay the two spins. You know, just if we moved the spin of electron two, you know, up here, they would overlay perfectly and they move in perfect concert. This is an alpha-alpha situation where both electrons have the alpha spin and if we add them together, we simply get a vector that is twice the length in the same direction as the one we started with. Likewise, we can think about two beta spins and this is highly analogous to the first situation where we have two electrons, both with beta spins. And again, if I take the spin vector for electron two and I just kind of tack it on the end of the spin vector for electron one, we again arrive at a vector that's just twice as long, pointing in the same direction as the spin vector for electron one. This is another way to achieve a total spin of s equal to one. It's called the t minus state because these are down spins and the spin in the z direction, what we've called sz, is equal to negative one. Over here, the, the z component of the resultant vector is equal to plus one. This is why this is called the T plus state. There's actually another way to achieve a total resultant equal to one, and that's to use alpha and beta spins that are in phase with one another rather than being 180 degrees out of phase as they were in the singlet state. In this situation, both alpha and beta vectors are located in the same vertical this may be a little bit difficult to see in just two dimensions, but take my word for it and try to visualize it. The alpha and beta vectors are living in the same plane, and actually the planar view is shown for you here of the T0 state. The alpha and beta vectors are coplanar. When we add these coplanar vectors together, we end up with a resultant that has a total spin, a total length, that capital S equal to 1. And this is our criterion for the triplet state, right? That S must add to one. The difference now is that if we think about the Z component of the spin, it's now equal to zero, since the up and down nature of the alpha and beta states cancel one another uh, along the Z axis. And so in this state, M sub S, as this figure calls it, or what we're calling S sub Z is equal to zero. This is why this is called the T zero state, and it involves alpha and beta wave functions in phase. And so we can see for the triplet state, although the total spin is equal to plus one in all three cases, there are three different ways to achieve this. And the three different ways are associated with different energies when a magnetic field is applied. And this is essentially how we know that the triplet state is a triplet. In a magnetic field oriented in a particular direction, the T plus, T zero, and T minus states take on different energies. And we can observe, for example, transitions between these energies. These tend to be very small energies. For example, electron spin resonance experiments can observe transitions between these levels when a magnetic field is applied. Finally, I want to contrast the triplet state with the singlet state in terms of the phase of the T0 situation because the, the Z component of the spin is zero in the T0 state and of course the same is true in the singlet state. So what's the difference? Well, the difference comes down to the phase of the spin vectors. In the singlet state, the alpha and beta vectors are 180 degrees out of phase. If we take, for example, this point and project it down onto this cone, we have to move around the circle 180 degrees to arrive at where the tip of the beta vector of electron two is located. They're 180 degrees out of phase. This leads to both a zero Z component and a total spin equal to zero in the case of the singlet state. In the triplet state, those vectors are now in phase. And so again, if we take the point where the alpha vector for electron one hits the cone and project it down, we will arrive directly at the point where the beta vector hits the cone. And that's probably easiest to see in this coplanar view right here these alpha and beta vectors are exactly aligned and pointed in the same x and y direction, just oriented differently along the z-axis. This results in a situation where the total spin is one, but the spin in the z direction is still zero. So 
the T0 state is fundamentally different from the S0 state in terms of the, the phase. Now the alpha and beta vectors are in phase. And in the total spin angular momentum, which is one for the triplet state and zero for the singlet state.